Uh, it is my great pleasure to welcome Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, and this year's Owen Roberts Memorial Lecture in Constitutional Law. Um, we're very proud to partner with the National Constitution Center tonight. Uh, Penn President Amy Gutman will introduce Justice Ginsburg along with uh, National Constitution Center President uh, and CEO Jeff Rosen in a moment. But first, I want to introduce a bit of the history of the Roberts Lecture. The lecture uh, is named for Supreme Court Justice and Penn Law Dean Owen J. Roberts. Uh, and it was established in 1956, co-sponsored by the law school and its chapter of Order of the Coif. Um, the, the wording of the original uh, agreement about the lecture, I'm going to quote here. It says, the lecture is to be delivered by, quote, a nationally prominent person in either public or academic life who might be expected to make a significant contribution in legal thought. <laughs> so I think we've met and exceed and blown out of the water that standard tonight with Justice Ginsburg. Um, and we celebrate Justice Ginsburg's 25 years on the Supreme Court, as well as groundbreaking contributions to American jurisprudence, both while on the court and in her uh, tremendous career as a uh, legal scholar, um, as a uh, litigator, and as a um, um, lower court judge before she joined the court. Um, Justice Roberts himself uh, was a Penn, graduate of Penn Law, served for 20 years on the Penn Law faculty, then went off to a tremendous career in mostly in government service. He served as justice on the Supreme Court from 1930 to 1945, and then in a move which would be unthinkable today, left the Supreme Court to become dean of, of Penn Law. Um, <laughs> so we don't get any ideas. So, so <laughs> we, um, we, we honor his memory and his legacy, and there's no better way to, to, to honor it than by uh, Justice uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg tonight. Um, it's now my, my pleasure to introduce uh, Penn's president, Amy Gutman, who since 2004 has been a visionary leader at Penn and, and nationally and internationally as the eighth president of the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, her academic background as a moral and political philosopher is reflected in her commitment at Penn to increasing diversity, interdisciplinary excellence, civic leadership, and service. She has won national recognitions for her achievements in these areas. Under her leadership, Penn has become the nation's largest university offering an all-grant financial aid policy to meet the full need of uh, a diverse array of undergraduate students and has significantly expanded the number of students from low-income, middle-income, and first-generation college families at Penn. Dr. Gutman is a member of the Global University Leaders Forum, an advisory group to the World Economic Forum on matters of global policy importance, and was a founding member of the Global Colloquium of University Presidents, which advises the UN Secretary General on educational and global policy issues. She served as chair of President Obama's Presidential Commission uh, for the Study of, of Bioethics, uh, which helped explore and define ethical issues ranging from neuroscience to Ebola to epidemic disease. Um, at Penn and throughout the country, she has been a champion of free, open um, debate and civil society and has built a welcoming and inclusive and excellent university environment. Uh, we're very proud to call her our president here at Penn, uh, Amy. Wow. Thank you, thank you, Ted, and it's wonderful to welcome so many friends of the National Constitution Center, of the University of Pennsylvania, of Penn Law, and of notorious RBG. Uh, being, being a judicial rock star is not an oxymoron. It is one of the most important services to our society that I, for one, can imagine. And I know I speak for everybody here tonight when I say how absolutely thrilled we are to welcome the Associate Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And I consider it a personal privilege to introduce someone I above all admire and with whom I also feel a deep kinship. 10 years ago, we both appeared, it was my privilege, um, it was her service to appear together in a documentary, a PBS documentary entitled The Jewish Americans. Um, I appeared once, she was the most powerful voice throughout this documentary. And I'll never forget the version of the, her life story that she told 
very vividly in a riddle that comes in many versions. But here's her version of the riddle. What's the difference between a bookkeeper in New York's garment district and a Supreme Court justice? One generation. That is a quintessentially American story, story of the American dream that her life is dedicated to keeping alive. This is the story of a woman who by grit and determination, by brains and courage, by compassion and a fiery commitment to liberty and justice for all, rose from unadorned beginnings to become one of the most respected and yes, most beloved justices of our time. This is the story of our very special guest, Associate Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Over the course of the past 25 years, Ruth Bader Ginsburg has won renown for her brilliant and steadfast service on the Supreme Court of the United States and her service to the U.S. Constitution. The U.S. Constitution that unites our nation and some would say, I would say, defines our nation. Named to the Supreme Court by President Clinton in 1993, Ruth Bader Ginsburg has distinguished herself as a brilliant justice, a passionate advocate for justice and equality before the law, and an astute consensus builder within the court. She has lived the life of a pioneer. As a young woman, she left Flatbush, Brooklyn, another reason why I feel a deep kinship to her. I, too, was born in Flatbush, Brooklyn. She left to attend college at Cornell, where she graduated at the top of her class, of course. She was among just nine women allowed to enter Harvard Law School at a time when the dean asked, how could she justify taking a spot from a qualified man? Far from dissuading her, such challenges to basic equity galvanized a steely resolve. She went on to become the first tenured woman faculty member at Columbia Law School. This is not the first time Associate Justice Ginsburg has graced Philadelphia with her presence. In 2007, we had the privilege at the University of Pennsylvania to bestow upon her our highest honor, an honorary degree, a doctor of law, honoris causa. We did this in recognition of the great contribution she has made to making our country ever more just, equitable, and true to the highest ideals of the United States Constitution. Among a lifetime of pioneering efforts in pursuit of justice, Ruth Bader Ginsburg became a founder of the American Civil Liberties Union Women's Rights Project, arguing six cases before the Supreme Court, winning five of them, an amazing batting average for anyone, a lifetime amazing record. She also co-authored the first law school casebook on sex discrimination. Associate Justice Ginsburg is widely and justly heralded as our nation's preeminent jurist of gender law and gender equity. By her relentless work and formidable public intellect, she has advanced the legal status of women and the cause of justice for women and men, for girls and boys everywhere. We are simply thrilled to have her here with us this evening. Thank you so much, Associate Justice Ginsburg, our notorious RBG. Thank you. I also have the true pleasure of welcoming to the stage with Justice Ginsburg, a champion of our Constitution, a civic leader here in Philadelphia, and a dear friend, Jeffrey Rosen.
a professor of law at George Washington University, a noted commentator on legal affairs, and the author of six books. Since 2013, Jeffrey has served as the president and CEO of the National Constitution Center. Jeffrey has brought energy, excitement, and above all, vision to the important work of the National Constitution Center. He is a true civic leader. We are grateful for his leadership of this truly unique institution. So, truth in advertising, this evening's Roberts Lecture will not be a lecture at all, but rather a candid conversation between two minds who are steeped in the history, the values, and the challenges of American constitutional law. I know we're in for a fascinating evening. I know there's never been a more important time to have this conversation. So please join me, ladies and gentlemen, in welcoming Jeffrey Rosen and the Honorable Ruth Bader Ginsburg. everyone be seated. <laughs> Justice Ginsburg, it is such an honor and a pleasure to welcome you back to the National Constitution Center. Uh, the last time I saw you was on October 20th when you did me and my wife Lauren, who is here in the front row, the great honor of marrying us. So thank you for that wonderful experience. And since then, as uh, President Gutman said, you have indeed been a judicial rock star on tour up the entire Acela corridor with standing <laughs> ovations and uh, thrilled audiences. And your travels have taken you to Sundance where you saw a documentary about yourself. So I'm gonna begin by asking, how was the documentary? In my not unbiased opinion, it they have done a fantastic job. The, the two filmmakers, Betsy West and Julie Cohn, did a series for PBS some years ago called The Makers. And it was about the women's movement in the 1970s. So it included Betty Friedan, Bella Absalom, Gloria Steinem, Susan Sontag, uh, Bill Schlafly. It, it was done so well that I was persuaded uh, to say yes to their proposal. Well, our task tonight, and as Amy said, this is an important moment to have this conversation, is to take stock of the progress of gender equality from the time you began in the 1970s, through your time on the Supreme Court, to this remarkable moment we're in right now. And because it's on everyone's mind, and because you've been asked about it every single place that you've gone over the past couple of weeks, I need to begin, and I want to have a, everyone is eager for your thoughts on this. What are your thoughts on the Me Too movement, and will it prove lasting progress for women's equality? It's a question I was asked this afternoon at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. And I think what I wanted to, to convey there was that sexual harassment of women uh, has gone on forever, but it didn't get headlines until a woman named Catherine McKinnon wrote a book called Sexual Harassment in the Workplace. And that was the start of litig litigation under Title VII. A few cases came to the Supreme Court and they all came out right. But still, <laughs> women were hesitant. I think one of the principal reasons were they feared that they would not be believed. 
the number of women who have come forward as a result of the Me Too movement has been uh, astonishing. And my hope is not just that it is here to stay, but that it is as effective for the woman who works as a maid in a hotel as it is for Hollywood stars. Many women are wondering, will this prove a lasting advance for women? Or like previous discussions of sexual harassment in the 90s, will this advance pass? I think it will have staying power because people, and not only women, men as well as women, realize how wrong the behavior was and how it subordinated women. So we shall see, but my prediction is that it is here to stay. Why is it happening now? You've told me in conversations over the years that it's activism by men and women that causes cultural and political change. Is there something about what millennials are doing that has caused the Me Too movement, or is it coming from something else? Well, I think we can compare it to the gay rights movement. When people stepped up and said, this is who I am and I am proud of it, they came out in numbers instead of hiding disguising, that movement developed very rapidly. And I think we're seeing the same thing with sexual harassment. Did you see this one coming? No, no. And why did it happen just when it did? I've heard from uh, women who told stories about Harvey Weinstein many, many years ago. And then the Times decided to do a big story on it. I think it was the press finally taking notice of something that they knew long before that propelled it uh, into the place it now holds in the public arena. What is your advice to all women, young women, and, and to all women about how to sustain the momentum of the movement and to make its changes lasting? I, I think the, the number of cases that we have seen, I mean, how this has burdened. I've heard from lawyers that women have come forward with stories about things that happened many years ago. And even though the statute of limitations has long passed, these cases are being settled. One interesting thing is whether it will be an end to the confidentiality pledge. Women who complained and brought suit were offered settlements in which they would agree that they would never disclose what they had complained about. I suspect we will not see those agreements anymore. What are the legal changes necessary to make these reforms permanent? Well, we, have, we have the legal reform. We've had it for a long time. Uh, Title VII, it was argued early on that sexual harassment has nothing to do with gender discrimination. Everyone knows boys will be boys, and that was that. Was that. But there, there are state and federal laws. The laws are there, the laws are in place, it takes people to step forward and use them. 
at Sundance, you told your, old, your own Me Too story of an encounter you had in a, at Cornell long ago. Yes. Uh, tell, tell the audience about that. I was in a chemistry class uh, at Cornell. I was not very adept in, in the laboratory. So a teaching assistant decided to help me out. Help me out so much that he offered to give me a practice exam the day before the actual exam. When I went into the room and looked at the exam paper, I found that it was the practice exam. And then I knew immediately what this instructor expected as the payoff. So instead of being shy, I confronted him and said, how dare you do this? That's one of many, many stories that every woman of my vintage knows. How dare you do this? Yeah. What would you advise women to say in similar situations? Should they be similarly strong? Yes. <laughs> this is bad behavior. You should not engage in it, and I will not submit to it. But I think it's easier today because there are numbers to support the wom woman who says so. And we will no longer hear as often we as we did in the past. She's making it up. And this is an important question. What is your advice to men in this new regime where, where people are trying to behave well and figure out what the new norms are? How should yeah, men just, behave? Just think how you would like the women in your family to be treated, particularly your daughters. And when you see men behaving in ways they shouldn't, you should tell them. This is improper behavior. There is a debate, both among uh, women and among men, about what sort of behavior should be sanctionable. And one group is saying that it's wrong to lump together violent behavior like Harvey Weinstein with less dramatic forms of sexual misconduct and others say that all misconduct is wrong and should be sanctioned. Well, there are degrees, there are degrees of conduct, yes. But any time a, a woman is put in a position where she is inferior, subordinate, there should be the, she should, she should complain and should not be afraid. There are also calls uh, from people of different perspectives, to, from Catherine Deneuve to others of, of, of rather different perspectives for due process. What about due process for well, the accused? That must not be ignored, and it goes beyond sexual harassment. It, um, The person who is accused has a right to defend herself or himself. And we certainly should not lose sight of that, uh, recognizing that these are complaints that should be heard. So there, there's been criticism of some college codes of conduct for not giving the accused person a fair opportunity to be heard. And that's one of the basic tenets of our system, as you know. Everyone deserves a fair hear hearing. Are some of those criticisms of the college codes valid? Do I think they are? Yes.
I think people are hungry for your thoughts about how to balance the values of due process against the need for increased gender equality. It's, it's not one or the other. It's, it's both. I mean, we, we have a system of justice where people who are accused get due process. So it's just applying to this field what we have applied generally. Some women also fear backlash. They worry that women may have less opportunity for mentorship at work uh, because guys are afraid of interacting with them. Is this valid or not? Well, let me ask you, uh, as a man, do you think that um, you, you will be hesitant to encourage women because of the Me Too movement? On the contrary. I have felt, like many men, sensitized to the plight of women by hearing these stories, and it seems like an entirely salutary thing in the workplace. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so what is next? Your entire towering career as a litigator and advocate and as a justice has studied the interplay between political and social movements and the law. And you said, you said just this afternoon that the courts are the least important part of social change. First comes political activism and public education, and then legislation, and then the courts. So looking forward 10 or 20 years, how does the momentum of the Me Too movement get reflected in legislation and in judicial decisions? Well, as I said, I think the law is there, and there are the people now who will use it uh, in increasing numbers. Um, what I said before is that rights have to start with people who want them. And then um, the court is a reactive institution. There was a fine federal judge on the Fifth Circuit, Judge Goldberg, who once said, the courts don't make the conflagrations, but they do their best to put them out. Marsha uh, Greenberger, in her wonderful talk this afternoon, mentioned some of your dissenting opinions in the sexual harassment cases. Is there any area for progress in the law, and might your dissents be vindicated? Well, a dissent, there are two kinds of dissents. In a statutory case, your aim is to get the legislature to correct the error into which the court has fallen. And I think this afternoon, Lily Ledbetter's case was the sterling example of that. Lily was an area manager in a Goodyear tire plant. She was when she started working there in 1978, the only woman doing that job. And one day, a coworker put in her mailbox a slip of paper with a series of numbers. Lily recognized immediately what that was. It was the pay that all the area managers were receiving. And Lily recognized immediately that she was being paid less than any of the men, indeed less than the person she had trained to do the job. So, uh, she screwed up her courage and brought a Title VII suit, discrimination suit against Goodyear. And she did win a substantial verdict. Uh, it was a jury trial. When the case got to the Supreme Court, they dismissed it on the ground that she sued too late. The law, Title VII, requires that you complain within 180 days of the discriminatory incident. Well, 
Lily had let the system go on for two decades and didn't complain. But of course, if she had, first, how could she? She didn't have the salary figures. But assuming that she did, and she complained at the first indication that she was paid less, the defense is clear. The defense would have been, oh, it has nothing to do with Lily being a woman. She just doesn't do the job as well. But then, when she's done the job year after year and gets good performance ratings, that defense is no longer available and she has a winnable case. But the court said she sued too late. There was a simple basis for saying she was on time. Every paycheck that she received reflected the differential. So she could sue within 180 days of any paycheck. The reaction to Lily's case, oh, by the way, I ended the dissent by saying the ball is now in Congress's court to correct the error the court has made. And in very short order, the Lily Blood Better Fair Pay Act was passed with overwhelming majorities on both sides of the aisle. And it was the first piece of legislation that President Obama signed when he, when he took office. You can write a dissent like that when it's a statutory case, because Congress can fix it. If it's a constitutional case, Congress can't fix it. Uh, it would have, the change would have to come about either through constitutional amendment, and our Constitution is powerfully hard to amend. Congress lets it out, and it takes three-fourths of the states to ratify. I know from experience with the Equal Rights Amendment how hard it is to amend the Constitution. So the next best thing is for, uh, not the best, next best thing, it's, it is the better thing, is for the court to correct the mistake it has made. And we have had a long tradition of dissents becoming the law of the land. One example are the free speech dissents of Justices Holmes and Brandeis, and you, Jeff, know a lot about those. Um, another example is the dreadful Dred Scott decision. There were two dissenters who recognized that was wrong. There was the first Justice John Marshall Harlan, who dissented in the so-called civil rights cases. And then some 13 years later in Plessy against Ferguson, I think it's good when we look back to see that there were people who thought the court judgment was wrong and wrote the judgment that, was, that starts out as a dissent and then in the next generation becomes, <clears throat> becomes the opinion of the court. Which of your powerful dissents do you most hope to become a majority? Well, I'd like to see a Shelby County undone. <clears throat> that was a case involving the Voting Rights Act of 1965. It was, uh, uh, the way the law works is this. If a state <coughs> or, a, or a city or a county 
has had a history of blocking African Americans from voting. Any change in voting legislation would have to be pre-cleared either by the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice or by a three-judge court sitting in the District of Columbia. The, the court's position was, that was 1965, it's many years later, some states that discriminated may not be discriminating anymore. So the Congress has to come up with a, a new formula. Well, what member of Congress is going to stand up and say, my district is still discriminating? <laughs> um, and I thought that my colleagues were not as restrained as they should be because they should have respected the overwhelming vote in the Congress to renew, to renew the Voting Rights Act. So that's one decision. How about two or three more? <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's see. Uh, do you have one of mine to suggest? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, one of them is the, the so-called, uh, what do they call it? Partial birth abortion. Mm. This was a medical procedure that is no one's first choice, but it may be the only option for a woman. And when the court um, refused to recognize that a ban on such a procedure just overlooked that some women had no other choice. So that's a decision I would like to see overruled. If you go back in time, um, two decisions from the 70s, the Supreme Court held that Medicaid coverage was not available for any abortion, therapeutic or non-therapeutic, which left us with a situation in, in our country where any woman of means, or any woman who can afford to go to a neighboring state will have <coughs> access to abortion. The people who won't are poor people who can't travel, who can't take off days from work. And that's a sorry situation. You know, people ask me, oh, well, what would happen if Roe v. Wade were overruled? And my answer is, for affluent women, it won't make any difference. There will be a number of states that simply won't return to the way it once was. At the time of uh, Roe v. Wade decision, there were four states, New York among them, uh, that provided abortion in the, in the first trimester with no, no questions asked. Those states and others will not go back to the way it was. And so the, the situation that we have, uh, I think is most unfortunate that the people who are disadvantaged are the most voiceless people, um, the poor women. So that's it. that decision and other restrictive uh, abortion decisions I would like to see overruled. 
Carhartt dissent was one where you set out a vision of access to abortion as central to equal citizenship, which goes back to your earliest days. Central to the woman's right, her ability to control her own destiny. How should that right be applied more broadly, and what are its implications if the court were to take it seriously? It would mean that women would have access to something that should be part of health care, uh, like any other uh, condition. One of your uh, great hopes is for men and women to take equal responsibility for childcare. I had that remarkable moment when I interviewed you years ago in the 90s, and you pointed to a picture of your son-in-law with, with your then infant grandson and said, that's my hope for the future, when men take equal responsibility for women with childcare. Why is that so central to women's equality? And are we doing better now than we were 10 or 20 years ago? And we are doing a, a lot better. Um, when I was in my last year of law school, I was attending Columbia Law School. My daughter was between three and four. There was only one nursery school in that entire area uh, would take a child from 9 to 12 or 2 to 5. By the time my daughter was a mother herself and teaching at Columbia Law School, there were over two dozen full-day daycare facilities in that area. Uh, a few of my law clerks uh, have taken parental leave, male law clerks. It's more common than it once was. My very first year on the court, I, I was served by a law clerk who had been with me on the DC circuit and his application was tremendously attractive to me. Why? Because he wrote that he was studying law at night at Georgetown, and the reason was that his wife, an economist, had a good job at the World Bank. And that and one other thing. He submitted as his writing sample his first year of law school a writing exercise and it was the theory of contract as illustrated in Wagner's Ring Cycle. Uh, <laughs> How is the theory of contract when illustrated? I, and I, uh, I must say cycle. about that too, I asked, I asked the chief, this is way back, 1993 and 94, if he could have access to Westlaw and um, Lexis at home. And the chief said, no. The law clerks were expected to stay however long it was necessary on the premises. The next year after that, all of the law clerks had access to Westlaw and Lexis at home. We'll save, we'll save the Wagner question and take it <laughs> offline, but I'm, I know that the audience is, uh, is burning. This is from 1986, and I'm saying this because this is such a golden time, and it's very important that the audience understand how far you think we've come from when you started off and where we have to go. So you said in 1986, in this piece, some thoughts on the 19-era debate between special versus equal treatment feminism, were I queen, my principal affirmative action plan would have three legs, 
First, it would promote equal educational opportunity and effective job training for women. Second, my plan would give men encouragement and incentives to share more evenly with women the joys, responsibilities, worries, upsets, and sometimes tedium of raising children from infancy to adulthood. And third, the plan would make quality daycare available from infancy on. How far have we come in achieving mm -hmm. those goals? We, we have come a considerable distance. But I, as what I, I just described as one nursery school in an area to now, I mean, the, the changes I've seen in my, my lifetime has been enormous. Of course, we haven't reached nirvana, but the progress that we made makes me hopeful for, for the future. By the way, I said in that affirmative action plan that, uh, that uh, my affirmative action plan would be for men as teachers in kindergarten and grade schools. Oh, wow. I, would, <laughs> I think that that would be um, wonderful for children if they could see men in caring roles just as they see women. There was a piece just yesterday in the New York Times about how kids who saw toys that defied gender stereotypes were more likely to think that girls should play with trucks and boys with dolls. Is it important yes. to break down yes. stereotypes? Yes. Ms. Magazine had a, a record of, of songs for children, and one of them was William has a doll. The, 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 the recording is called Free to Be You and Me. It was done by Marlo Thomas. I grew up on that TV show, and I <laughs> think it's in my mind right now. Yeah. Well, what is your message to the next generation of feminists? What are the goals that remain to be achieved? It's the unconscious bias. It's, Awfully hard to get a handle on. Unconscious bias. Well, my favorite illustration is the symphony orchestra. When I was growing up, never saw a woman in a symphony orchestra, except perhaps the harpist. Howard Taubman, who was a well-known critic for the music critic for the New York Times swore that he could tell the difference blindfolded, whether it was a woman playing the piano, or a man, or the violin. So someone had the bright, bright idea of putting him to the test, blindfolded him, and what happened? He was all mixed up. He identified <laughs> a, a, a pianist as a, man when it was a woman, and he was good enough to admit uh, that unconscious bias was operating. So someone then got the even brighter idea to put up a curtain between the people who are auditioning and the judges. And that simple device, almost overnight, led to women showing up in symphony orchestras in numbers. Now, I wish we could have a drop curtain in every field of endeavor. But one example of the unconscious bias that uh, still exists was a Title VII suit brought in the late 70s. And it was, the plaintiffs were women who had um, not succeeded in getting middle management jobs at AT&T. They did very, very well on all the standard criteria, but they flunked disproportionately at the last stage. And what was that last stage? It was what was called a total person test. 
the total person test was an executive uh, interviewing the candidate for promotion. Uh, why were women dropping out disproportionately? It was because of a certain discomfort that the executive had in dealing with someone who is different. If he's interviewing a man, well, he sort of knows this person is just like me and he's comfortable. But if it's a woman or a member of a minority group, he feels un uncomfortable. And this person is a stranger to him. And that shows up in how he rates the candidate. So the solution to unconscious bias is to bring men and women well, to Well, the, the more women that there are, this is something Justice O'Connor often said, uh, that women of, of our age should get out there and make a good show. And that will encourage other women. And the more women that are out there doing things, the better off all of us will be. It's a time of such anxiety. Uh, the political system is so polarized. Uh, men and women are figuring out how to interact with each other. What is your advice about how civil interactions are possible, and I do want to share the advice that you gave to Lauren and me, and that you give to so many couples who you marry, okay. about My what your mother-in-law mother told you. But then explain what the lesson is, because it's profound and it's very wise. This, if you, you are referring to my mother-in-law's advice on my wedding day? Yes. I was married in my husband's home, and just before the ceremony, my mother-in-law took me aside and said, I'd like to tell you the secret of a happy marriage. Well, I'd be glad to know what it is. She said, dear, in every good marriage, it helps sometimes to be a little deaf. <laughs> and that is advice I have applied not only in 56 years of marriage, but to this day in my current workplace. If <laughs> I don't know if an unkind word is said, you just tune out. It's a profound lesson about never reacting in anger, in always maintaining your equanimity, and if others lose their temper, not losing yours. Well, it, emotions like anger, remorse, and jealousy are not productive. Uh, they will not accomplish anything. So you must keep them under control. So in the, in the days when I was a flaming feminist litigator, I never said to judges who asked an improper question, you sexist pig. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you one such incident. So I was arguing a case in Trenton, New Jersey, before three-judge federal district court. And the judge commented to me, well, women are doing fine these days. The opportunities for them are equal everywhere. Um, and I said, y Your Honor, flight training isn't available to women. Oh, he, he said, even in the military, they have equal opportunity. And I, and I answered him with, flight training is not available. His response to me was, oh, don't tell me that. 
Women have been in the air forever, I know from experience with my own wife and daughter. So what is my comeback? I've, I've met some men who don't have their feet planted firmly on the ground. <laughs> nice. You don't hear that anymore, but in the 70s, when judges knew that it was improper to make racist jokes, and women were still fair game. This must have been extraordinary, the things that you heard and experienced back then, and yet you always kept your cool. Uh, yes, because I wanted to, to win my case. <laughs> You know, my old chief, who I came to love, Chief Justice Rehnquist, especially after he wrote the decision upholding the Family Medical and Leave Act. But my very last argument in the Supreme Court was in the fall of 1978. It was a case about putting women on juries. Young people today are astonished when they're told that it was not all that long ago when women were either not put on the jury rolls, they could opt in if they wanted to, but they were not called otherwise, or they were on the roll, but a woman, any woman was exempt. Um, so I divided that argument with a public defender from Kansas City, Missouri. I had 15 minutes and I was about to sit down confident that I had gotten out everything I wanted to, to convey. And then Justice Rehnquist commented, so Mrs. Ginsburg, you won't settle for Susan B. Anthony's face on the new dollar. Then Berger said something, Chief Justice Berger said something polite, and that was that. In the cab going back to Union Station, I thought, oh, why didn't I, why wasn't I quick enough to think of the perfect answer, which would have been, no, Your Honor, tokens won't do. <laughs> But think that it was not so long ago that most of the social clubs in this city, in New York, in Washington, D.C., were men, men only. So whenever I was asked to speak at those clubs, I said, I'm not going to speak at a place that wouldn't welcome me as a member. Some very distinguished groups, uh, the American Law Institute, for example, when the council met in New York, they had uh, dinners at the Century Association. And I um, wrote a, an explanation of why they should not be meeting there. Most people agreed with me, some didn't because they switched to the Harvard Club where the food was not comparable. <laughs> I first, my, my first encounter with that was when my husband was working for a, a law firm in New York and they had the holiday party at a club that did not admit women. The women associates let it be known that that was improper. They weren't listened to. So the next year, none of the women associates showed up at the holiday party. And the year after that, the holiday party was held at a place that welcomed women as well as men. It's extraordinary to think of how different things were from a world where women couldn't go to holiday parties or join clubs to today. 
does it seem like extraordinary progress or is it inadequate? What is your assessment of the progress that we've made since then? Well, it's, it, the progress has been enormous and that's what makes me hopeful for, for the future. The signs are all around us. I think in the elections in the fall of 2018, there will be more women running for office than ever before on every level, level local, state, federal. When, uh, when I was nominated for the good job I now have, I think the Senate was conscious that there were no women on the Judiciary Committee. So they added to, uh, for my nomination, and they have never gone back to an all-male committee since then. Is it, a, is it a good thing that women are galvanized to run for office? And what would you tell those who are hesitating and trying to decide whether to run? I, th I think the, the, the women today have a lot more support than they once did of groups encouraging them, campaigning for them. Well, th think even of our court. Sandra Day O'Connor was appointed in 1981. There had never been a woman before. When I was appointed to the DC Circuit by Jimmy Carter, Jimmy Carter was a man who changed, literally changed the complexion of the US judiciary. He wasn't a lawyer himself. He looked around at the federal judiciary and he said, they all look just like me, just like me. They're all white men. But that's not how the great United States looks. And I want my judges to be drawn from all of the people and not just some of them. So he made an effort to appoint minority group members and women not as one at a time curiosity, but in numbers. So he appointed, I think, over 25 women to the federal trial court, federal district court. He appointed 11 to courts of appeals, and I was one of the lucky 11. And when people asked, did you always want to be a judge? I smiled and said, when I, when I graduated from law school, there were no women on the federal appellate bench. There had been Florence Allen, who was appointed in 1934 by President Roosevelt, and she retired in 1959, and so then there were none. There were none until Shirley Huffstetler was appointed by President Johnson to the Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. Carter made Shirley Huffstetler the first ever Secretary of Education, so then they went on again. And then Jimmy Carter became president and set a pattern that no president has departed from. Reagan, President Reagan, not to be outdone, was determined to appoint the first woman to the Supreme Court. He made a nationwide search and came up with a splendid candidate, Sandra Day O'Connor. When I was a, a new justice, invariably at an oral argument session, a one lawyer or another would call me Justice O'Connor. <laughs> they knew there was a woman on the Supreme Court, so a woman's voice meant it had to be Justice O'Connor. 
And nowadays, there are three of us, one third of the bench. And because of my seniority, I sit close to the middle. Justice Sotomayor is on one end, Justice Kagan on the other. And anyone who has watched argument at the court knows that my female colleagues are not shrinking violets. <laughs> They're very active in the colloquy that goes on at argument. When Justice Scalia was with us, I think he and Justice Sotomayor had a contest who could ask the most questions. <laughs> You, you were interested in that survey that found that the women justices were interrupted more. What is your considered judgment about whether that was Well, I think problem? my colleagues will notice that and perhaps be more careful. But we all, we do interrupt each other as the former law clerks here know. And one of the most amusing incidents of that uh, there was an oral argument, and Justice O'Connor, who often asked the first question, uh, and I thought that, that she was done, so I asked a question, and she said, just a minute, I'm not finished. I apologized to her at lunch. She said, Ruth, don't give it another thought. The guys do it to each other all the time. <laughs> the next day in USA Today is a headline. Rude Ruth interrupts Sandra. <laughs> and I was asked to comment on that, so I said what Sandra had said at lunch, the men interrupt each other regularly, and you haven't noticed that. That reporter, to his credit, watched the court through the next two sittings and said, you know, you're right. I just never noticed it when it was two men. And then uh, an academic whose specialty was language wrote an op-ed piece in the Washington Post to explain how this happened, how I interrupted Sandra. And she said, well, Ruth is a um, Justice Ginsburg is a Jew who grew up in, in New York City, and those people talk fast. Justice O'Connor is a girl of the Golden West, laid back, speaks slowly. Well, people who knew the two of us recognized immediately that Sandra got out two words to my every one. But it's a Wonderful example of the stereotype. You have a very different style on the bench and in conversation. On the bench, you are right in there, but in conversation, all of your friends know that it's in the pauses that we have to wait because you're about to say something very special. <laughs> Yes, my law clerks know that too. <laughs> that I try to think before I speak. Well, it's uh, something that my husband learned as a law teacher. He was concerned that the men were volunteering much more often than the women. And one of his colleagues gave him advice. She said, don't ever call on the first hand that's raised. That will invariably be a, a man. Wait five, six seconds, and you will see women's hands go up because the women were thinking before they spoke. <laughs> I'm so, you know we're out of time, but I just am reluctant to let you go because I feel like we have so much 
to learn from you, I want to ask you, You, you uh, what, I have learned so much from you. What, what, what and, and why, why is it good for men if, as you said recently, you, you said there should be nine women on the Supreme Court? No, I didn't say. They <laughs> you did. did. You they, did, and I don't think no, you were I didn't say there should be. They, <laughs> the question was, when will there be enough? Yes. So there'll be enough when there are nine. <laughs> So, for most of our history, except the times when the court was less than nine, one time they were 10, but they were, until Justice O'Connor, all men. And nobody thought anything was unusual about that. But you weren't joking, and it would be good for men and women if we we have had women. state Supreme Courts with all women. I think Minnesota did for a while. We have a number of, of states that have had a majority of, of women. Our neighbor to the north, Canada, has a woman as their chief justice and four women. So we're catching up. And why is it good? Is it because, as you say so powerfully, generalizations about the way men and women are can't guide you in particular cases, and therefore it shouldn't matter whether there are nine women or well, five women. There, there, there is a life experience that women have um, that brings something to the table. I think a collegial body is much better off to have diverse people of different backgrounds and experience. That can make our discussions more informed. And one case where it was evident was a 13-year-old girl who was suspected of having um, the wrong kind of pills in school. And she was taken to the girls' restroom and she was strip searched. The pills that she had in her purse, I think there was one Advil and one aspirin. After she was strip searched and no contraband found, she was put in a chair in front of the principal's office, and her mother was called to take her home. Her mother was, uh, let's say, uh, beside herself that her daughter had been humiliated in that way. So she brought a, a suit under our um, anti discrimination laws under 1983. And at the oral argument, the oral argument took a light tone. And one of my colleagues said, oh, the boys undress in front of each other in the locker room and there's nothing, nothing embarrassing about that. And my response was that a 13-year-old girl is not like a 13-year-old boy in that regard. It's a difficult stage in her growing up. And there was um, suddenly no more jokes. I guess the, my colleagues were thinking of their wives, of their daughters. But that kind of insight I had, because I've grown up female. So it's not that women decide cases differently than men. They don't. There was a woman on the Supreme Court of Minnesota, Jean Coyne, 
who said, at the end of the day, a wise old man and a wise old woman will reach the same judgment. But nevertheless, she said, we bring something to the table that was absent when the judiciary was all male. Can men become more enlightened? Well, I think you can answer that for yourself, <laughs> Jeff. You're wiser than I am. But, it's a very you know, important no, question. Well, Will men become more enlightened? Yeah, you, you can see what happened in the 70s. Up until then, the Supreme Court never saw a gender-based classification that it didn't like, or at least that it didn't think was constitutional. One of my favorite cases from the not so good old days is Gossett against Cleary. A woman owned a tavern and her daughter was her bartender. The state of Michigan passed a law that said a woman couldn't tend bar unless they were married to the, either married or the daughter of a male tavern owner. Well, that meant that these two women would be put out of business. The Supreme Court made light of that case, uh, talking, starting out with talking about Chaucer's old ale wife, and then somehow, <laughs> instead of saying, yes, women are perfectly uh, capable of tending bar, said, well, women need to be protected. Uh, bars are Sometimes unpleasant things go on. Um, to their great credit, the Michigan um, Alcoholic Beverages Authority, when the Supreme Court said that the law was okay, decided that they were not, they were not going to enforce the law. So the, the gossips were able to keep their tavern. But that's, in, in fact, when I went to law school, that case, Gossard against Cleary, was described in, in an abbreviated paragraph as one example of the Supreme Court letting go of its stranglehold on social and economic legislation. It's a justification for this was, this was really health and safety legislation to protect women. Uh, from the rowdy drunks. The Supreme Court justices never thought that the ban didn't apply to the bar maids, the, the women who took the drinks to the table and were much more <laughs> in danger of the rowdy drunks than the woman standing behind the bar. That's where we were not so long ago. When Gwendolyn Hoyt, a woman from Hillsborough County, Florida, had a bitter dispute with her philandering, abusive husband and was humiliated to the breaking point, so she took out, she saw her young son's baseball bat in the corner of the room took it and with all her might hit her husband over the head. He fell against the stone floor, end of their altercation, beginning of the murder prosecution. There were no women on her jury. Her thought was that if the women were there, and not necessarily would she be acquitted, but she might be convicted of the lesser crime of manslaughter and not murder. Well, she was convicted of, uh, of murder by an all-male jury, and the argument in the Supreme Court was she doesn't have the opportunity for a jury drawn from a cross-section of the population because half the population is left out. And the Supreme Court said in 1961, 
is that law is simply reflecting women's place at the center of home and family life. In the next decade, three cases in a row, as the court made it clear that women had to be called, just as the men. That jury duty is an obligation, that citizens have obligations as well as rights. And if you exempt women, you are saying, they're expendable, we don't need them to be part of the administration of a justice system. So the changes I have seen in, in my long life uh, have, have been uh, just enormous. Your account of the human stories behind these cases so vividly brings those changes to life. At a Constitution Center event two years ago, you suggested that we create a series on those human stories. We did that with C-SPAN for the wonderful Landmark Cases series, yeah. and it was so popular that it's coming back by popular demand, and we're launching the second season here next Monday. Uh, what cases did you use? Uh, we are, for the second season, we're doing everything from the CATS uh, privacy case to the civil rights cases uh, we've done Marbury versus Madison, and I think and hope we're doing VMI, which is your great gender discrimination case, too. But you are absolutely right that telling those human stories helps us understand how the law has changed. We had reenactments. Uh, the, the Supreme Court Historical Society puts on reenactments, and we've done Bradwell against Illinois. That was the case in the 1870s of Myra Bradwell qualified to be admitted to the bar, but turned down because she was a woman. Um, that, in that case, the state of Illinois was so sure that they would win that they didn't even show up to argue. <laughs> they did a reenactment of Gossard against Cleary. And one of Brandeis' cases, Muller against Oregon, you, you had the most riveting talk at the New York Historical Society about Muller and Bradwell, and I invite the audience to check it out because it's an incredible story of evolution. Well, I've been selfish in keeping you this long, but I'm so reluctant to part, and we, we need to do that now. But I'll end with a very obvious but important question. You said this afternoon at this wonderful symposium at, at Penn Law School, where the students asked such great question, you said you were optimistic about the future because you had hope for the millennials. Yes. Which was I wonderful do. to hear. And I want to know, and I know the whole audience does too, what is your advice to those millennials about how they can best advance the cause of justice? Yes. Not alone, but in alliance with like minded people. I was impressed and heartened by uh, the Women's March in D.C., which has now been uh, repeated in many places all over the country. Uh, young people should appreciate the values on which our nation is based and how precious they, they are And if they don't become part of the crowd that seeks to uphold them, you know, it's something that Learned Hand said. If the spirit of liberty dies in the hearts of the people, there's no court capable of restoring it. But I can see the spirit of my, my grandchildren and their friends. And I have faith in this generation just coming into adulthood. Justice Ginsburg, for all you have done 
to advance the causes of liberty and equality and to defend the Constitution of the United States. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very, very much. Is that this thing?